Welcome, everybody. If you want to take your seats, we'll, um, we'll jump right in here. Uh, on behalf of the former, I want to thank everybody for coming out uh, this early evening to talk about a critically important issue, how we propel uh, the Paris Agreement and enable it to reach the kind of scale uh, that we know is required in order to keep global average temperature at a level we know is required. You know, whenever I think about the climate issue that we face today, I'm reminded of an image that a friend of mine, a British environmentalist, Adam Sweden, introduced me to. He, he described the climate issue today as a black elephant. And a black elephant is a cross between a black swan and the elephant in the room. Uh, a uh, uh, black swan, you know, is a um, low probability, hugely impactful event, catastrophic. And the elephant in the room is the problem that's sitting there right in front of you. You know it's there. And um, Adam calls the climate issue a black elephant. Um, it's right in the middle of the room. We can all see it. We all know the problem. You can't ignore it. And at the same time, it has vast black swan properties. That is, um, if it reaches the wrong uh, critical tipping point, it will have vast uh, uncontrollable consequences. And so that's really the thing we're here to try to talk about to avoid. Um, we've got a terrific panel to do that. Um, uh, we, we've got the uh, Prime Minister of Norway, we've got the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, we have former Vice President and global leader on this issue. We have the President of Kafko, a critically important Chinese food supply chain company and a representative of HSBC. So we're going to be able to look at this from the point of view of governance, the marketplace, and actual players in the world's second largest economy right now. I've asked everyone if they would just begin with a three-minute intervention on where they see the issue right now from their perspective, and then they're going to have to submit to my torturous questioning. Um, so we're going to be, I'm going to ask the Prime Minister uh, Hasna from Bangladesh if you would begin. Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Well, Bangladesh is a tale of climate ground zero. It is about our existence. While Bangladesh contributes least to global greenhouse gas emission, we pay dearly. Millions are forced to move silently. Bangladesh ratified the Paris Agreement with the hope that the global community will share responsibility for shared prosperity. Paris Agreement must deliver towards the low-income, climate-vulnerable countries. In 2009, out of own resources, we established a $400 million climate change trust fund. In 2012, we committed that Bangladesh would not exceed the average per capita emission of the developing world. We are shifting to a low carbon development path. We are transforming our manufacturing green. We are focusing on renewable energy and installed around 4.5 million solar home systems in Bangladesh. Over 15 million people now access electricity from these solar units. By 2018, Bangladesh will emerge as the largest solar nation globally. We are trying to make our agriculture climate resilient. For example, we developed stress-tolerant varieties of crops and innovations, halving water use in rice production, introducing solar-powered irrigation pumps. As we move to implement the Paris Agreement, there are areas global community, including business, can step in first. 
lives and livelihoods of our farmers, fishers, artisans, women are increasingly at risk. They need urgent support. We need greater focus on agriculture and food security. Make smart agriculture beneficial for small and marginal farmers. Give them knowledge on sustainable cropping and farm management across entire value chain. Develop quality, resilient, water-intensive seeds adaptive to local conditions for kick cereal and non-cereals. Get sustainable agri-inputs or solutions accessible to small and marginal farmers in the low-income countries. Second, global business and resource hold solutions that can save lives, crops, agri-resources. We need innovative, non-for-profit models or partnerships to roll the solutions to meet our needs. Third, Access to renewable and clean energy, energy efficient technologies, devices, implements are critical for our farming. Manufacturing, urban services, we need support and innovate to go beyond the existing global energy market modalities. Fourth, we are moving towards green growth path, but we need assured climate finance. As the world placed, half of the amount has to go to climate vulnerable countries. Fifth, transfer, adaptive development, sharing of technology are so critical. We, the world can no longer sit pretty on the excuse of intellectual protection. And now, even Technology Bank for LDCs is there for all to help the LTCs on technology. What we ask is access to life-saving technologies in agriculture, health, etc. that can bring in huge difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister Solberg. Thank you. Um, we have all greeted ourselves on that the Paris Agreement was historic. We have also greeted ourselves on the rapid entry into force that was um, without precedence. Um, but I think it's time to, to also say that um, um, after greeting ourselves, we have to, have to be uh, honest and say that um, we are far from delivering uh, sufficient emission cuts uh, all over the world, uh, and that the emission gaps remains a tremendous challenge that we have to work on. And of course, the responsibility with the way that the the Paris Agreement is built up. It lies with uh, each country. That means that we all have to fulfill our commitments to the Paris Agreement. Uh, but I also believe that we are in a good position of making transformative uh, decisions. I see, we see rapid technological uh, developments. The prices of renewable alternatives have fallen drastically to a bit of a challenge for an oil-producing country like Norway. But um, we see that the alternatives are growing in speed. Um, and I think we can see the promise and the potential of a low emission society in the future. Uh, but the window for making the right choices is small. We have to do it fast. Uh, the major investments we have to make in a few decades, and especially what decisions we are making on infrastructure, will determine our ability to, uh, to uh, reach that common um, objectives on climate that we have reached. I think there is um, three key priorities for the international community that I would like to highlight to accelerate that type of progress that uh, we see on country level. First, I think we all need to put the price on carbon. Uh, and we need to phase out subsidies for fossil fuels. The second, we need to strengthen the type of investment policy frameworks and investment capacity in the new types of technology. And we have to make sure also that we are investing in what could stop the change. And I think the biggest challenge we have that can stop the change towards low emission is the losing of jobs, the lack of economic development for people around the world, which is going, I, I think the concept of the, uh, the, the sustainable development goals is to see uh, 
the climate issue together with the social issues, and we have to make sure that we have policy frameworks and investment capacity, and, and that we also have using our public uh, money in smart way to mobilize climate-friendly private investments in, in the future. So I appreciate that Germany, during its G20 presidency, had put discussion on viable energy and climate strategies for the future on the table, trying to make an even more focus on how we can invest in this for the future. The third point I have is that we need to reduce deforestation globally, which is an issue Norwegian politicians have talked about and worked on for a long time. It's important not just for climate, it's also uh, important because of the extraordinary biodiversity of the forest and a livelihood of millions of people, but it is not possible to have low emission uh, economies and reach the climate goals if we are following up on the same level of deforestation as we see today. And we need to engage business and other stakeholders uh, to, to global action to change in the future. More to, as one contribution to this agenda, Norway will, provided that other partners from public and private sector contribute, we will establish a fund uh, that may catalyze billions of dollars of investment into innovative ways of increasing agricultural production to meet the global needs the, uh, and to protecting and restoring forests as un at unprecedented scales. We think we need a new type of initiative on this, and that's what we are trying to build now, and I hope we will get partners into that, because people who live around the large rainforests of the world, they need to have an outcome. They need to have ag agricultural production. They need to have a way of doing this, and we, and we will buy their products and, and be responsible consumers only if they are doing it in a responsible way. So we need to have some type of stronger action to make sure that the production lines are, in fact, not ruined in forests of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice President Gore. Well, first of all, Tom, uh, I would like to thank you for your work on this thank issue. The, the, the opinion columns you've written and the original reporting you've done thank you. uh, really deserve a, a special commendation, in Appreciate my that. opinion. There are really only three questions uh, remaining about the climate crisis. Uh, must we change? Looks like it might be hard. Uh, can we change? If we have to change but we can't, don't want to hear about it anymore. Just makes me nervous. The third question is, will we change? On the first question, must we change, I, most people in the world are now convinced, but we are reminded by some recent elections and appointments that not everybody is there. Today, NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the U.S. jointly officially announced that 2016 was the hottest year in recorded history. This is the third year in a row that that record has been broken. Every night on the television news now is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. People are connecting the dots and coming to the realization that the answer to that first question is yes. Second question, can we change? As Prime Minister Solberg said, the cost of renewable energy is coming down dramatically, almost as dramatically as computer chips did. Uh, it's similar to, to uh, mobile phones. And like mobile phones, they're spreading rapidly, particularly in areas of the world where there's not an existing landline grid. The latest contracts for solar electricity are down to 2.45 cents per kilowatt hour, half the cost of electricity from a, a coal burning plant. We need to stop building new coal burning plants, especially if I may say with all respect, in endangered uh, areas. Now, the third question, will we change? The Paris Agreement is the most inspiring uh, and greatest accomplishment since all the negotiating process began. And it was designed not only to secure agreement among nations of the world, but also consciously to send a signal to businesses, investors, civil society. That signal was sent, it has been received, there has been a dramatic change. We should concentrate on two of the mandatory provisions in the Paris Agreement. Not all of it's voluntary. Yeah. Mandatory information transparency so that NGOs and civil society 
can get actively involved in following the progress of each nation. Secondly, there is a five-year review process that's mandatory where each nation uh, reviews what it's done and looks at the continuing opportunities with cheaper renewable electricity, energy storage, efficiency, and sustainable agriculture and forestry, and, and upgrade their commitments. Uh, finally, I have a lot to say, but I Please. will just summarize with yeah. one final point. The mission of the World Economic Forum includes a close examination of the state of the world economy. And there's been much discussion here this week about the slow growth, stagnation, deep worry about where the economy is going. Monetary policy has been essentially used up. If we have a business cycle recession, we can't lower interest rates three, four points. What's left? What if we had a global project that was jobs intensive and that operated in every nation simultaneously, provided more liquidity to every community and lifted the vitality and dynamism of the global economy. Well, it turns out we have exactly such a global project if there is the vision and determination to seize it. We can retrofit every building in communities around this world. And if it's launched simultaneously, then the gestalt lifts the global economy. We need to build the infrastructure for renewable energy. We need to retrofit more efficient industrial and commercial uh, facilities. And we know from the experience of business leaders who started this that they make more money mm -hmm. and, and their brands are enhanced mm -hmm. and they do better. So uh, some people question whether we can do it, whether we will do it, but the will to act is itself a renewable resource. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Patrick. How does this all look from China and the point of view of a, someone involved in the agriculture supply chain? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> from, uh, excuse me for my sore throat. From uh, a perspective of the uh, agricultural uh, sector, I think it, it is the issue of uh, climate change is as simple to express as it is complex to achieve. It is literally our business as a Kafka, as a food and agribusiness, to sustain the people, to sustain the people in a way that sustains the planet. At Kafka, we speak of meeting tomorrow's demand. I believe that agricultural products that are needed for today's, today's consumption will be available for every person on this planet. So we say if we want to sustain the people, we have to sustain the world. With, with uh, uh, Paris, climate agreement, I think it is a priority for the government and the business world to reshape its policy making and business vision you know, that based on the low carbon model. And then to develop an execute roadmap to shape that, to shape toward you know, that low carbon future. Yeah. I think it is, uh, it is time for really for a private sector to take its responsibility. And I think it's, uh, it's in fact, it's an immense opportunity you know, for the private, private sector, especially the sectors that contribute most of, you know, to the climate change, you know, including energy, transportation, and agriculture, etc. Et if I can say from perspective of China, Chairman Xi raised the green growth concept, stating that clean and beautiful environment means great wealth for China. So at Kafka, we see that green, fully integrated value chain is our way of producing low carbon and high quality products. In order to, for, you know, for that to happen, I think definitely a favorable and predictable policy and market environment is pivotal to motivate large scale financing and innovation by private sector. So as, with regards to the to the challenge of our, of our industry, I have to say that you know, the agricultural industry faces a very unique challenge to produce more food while reducing, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission by food production. So the situation is urgent. As climate change already affected food and uh, agricultural and, and food security. Yeah. 
So without immediate action, we could put millions of people at hunger and poverty. Deep transformation in agricultural and food systems from pre-production to consumption are needed to maximize co-benefits of climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts. And this much is clear, the cause of inaction are much greater than the cause of the intervention, you know, which enables the, the farmers to respond effectively to climate change. Addressing emissions from land use change and the deforestation driven by agricultural expansion is essential. So choices facing food and agribusiness is clear, therefore, seize opportunities of carbon-constrained world and lead the way in shaping our transition to a sustainable economy, or continue our business as usual and face big, serious risks from regulation, shifts in technology, changing consumer expectations, and insecurity of supply. I'm stop, stop here. Thank you very much, Patrick. Stuart, uh, from the point of view of the banking world. Sure, thanks, Tom. So, so the reason HSBC has been engaged for quite some time in this is really the following. So we operate an op a banking operation in countries that are massively impacted. So the vulnerable 20, uh, India, China, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, where there's both deforestation, issues around coal to create electricity, etc. And at the same time, as Vice President Gore has said, we actually think this is one of the biggest catalysts for economic growth and job creation. So the estimates are it takes 90 trillion US dollars to basically execute what's been agreed in Paris in terms of replacing old infrastructure, building renewable, building infrastructure to greater renewable standards and actually developing the whole renewables industry. So that actually requires the financial markets to basically mobilize quite quickly. And to be honest, that's been quite slow to do so. And I think that's because the time horizons are seen beyond a credit cycle, a market risk cycle, frankly, a business cycle. So it's the next generation's problem. So we have to create some incentives to get this kind of going at a much faster pace. Markets are pretty good at pricing risk, but they actually struggle with pricing uncertainty. And, and actually, climate change for most companies is still perceived as uncertainty rather than a risk that can be priced. So clearing that uncertainty means companies and asset managers have got to basically um, disclose more about their exposure to high carbon markets, supply chains, and regional climate regulations, and that will enable that uncertainty to be translated into an effective assessment of risk. We did a survey back in December to try and basically see why there were more investors interested in, in investing in green bonds, and 50% of the investors simply say there's just inadequate information in terms of the disclosure of companies about what they're actually doing about this. So. We hugely support the work of the Financial Stability Board Task Force. So this is the project that Michael Bloomberg and Mark Carney um, sponsored to get further disclosure from companies. Um, I talked earlier in, in one of the um, closed sessions about the need, I think, for the central banks to require this actually to be compulsory. And actually, the way to do it is to require the banks and the insurance companies to actually get this information on their clients. Because as a regulated industry, we can be required to do so. The corporate sector is not necessarily regulated in the same linear way. The other thing we have to do is get a price on carbon. Um, whether we get a price on carbon um, uh, without a price on carbon, we are not basically going to move this thing forward. Because carbon pricing and disclosure are essentially two sides of the same coin, which effectively is to get a price that causes the, the substitution of alternatives. It's absolutely essential that we actually do get to this. We've spent a lot of time um, dancing around the issue of carbon pricing, mm -hmm. and I think we do need to get to a carbon price, and we need to get to a level of disclosure where, frankly, the industry, financing industry, whether it's the banking industry, the insurance industry, or, frankly, the capital markets, actually require this amount of data. Well, yeah, without a price, you'll never get scale, and without a scale, you'll never have a solution. Yeah. I mean, the, the green bond market, we did 75, as collectively all the banks, we underwrote 75 billion US dollars of green bonds last year, which was up from 48 billion in 2015. So we've got 75 billion with 90 trillion to raise. There's a bit of a gap. Yes, <laughs> to say the least. Um, uh, Prime Minister, I see, you know, let, let me ask you, uh, you know, downstairs they have a simulation wall, and, and uh, one of the simulations that they have, computer modeling, 
is actually the impact on Bangladesh of uh, a, a kind of business as usual trajectory for carbon emissions. And um, uh, I know it won't surprise you, but it's quite shocking to see that your entire country is underwater um, by, you know, uh, I don't remember it's 2050 or 2040, but um, uh, not exactly um, a, a long time to change course. So how do you wrestle with this challenge? You've got a vast population that needs energy. Um, uh, coal is right there for you to use. The simulation says, though, that if we don't change course, your country could be underwater. How do you personally wrestle and balance those issues? Well, uh, first thing, we have to develop our country. That is very, very important. Yeah. But because of the climate change or global warming, what we suspect that uh, if the sun, uh, sea rise, then we have Get a little closer to the mic, mm, yeah. You know, uh, well, we have to, you know, remove our people from those areas, I mean, this uh, vulnerable area, the lower portion of our country. But what we feel that the promises made in the Paris Agreement or since, uh, you know, the COP15, we receive only many promises, but in practical, we, receive, we didn't receive much. But after the Paris Agreement, definitely we become a little bit, you know, hopeful that something will happen or definitely, well, the developed country already they developed themselves. Now it is their responsibility to look, in, look into the LDCs or vulnerable countries. Like it is not only Bangladesh, also the small island country and other country. So, well, we have taken our steps with our humble way, with a very minimum. But I feel that it is uh, the main responsibility lies with the developed country. But in our own way, we have taken many steps. You know, as I mentioned earlier that with our own money, we have established the task fund and how to help our people. And also, as because you know, we have 160 million people, but our land boundary is very small. So we have to feed our people. So we have started you know, research how to produce more food for and Essential. to ensure food security. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely, I feel that the world community, they should come forward. And the private sector, business community, like banking sector or other uh, financial institutions, they have their responsibility. So they should, uh, they should take initiative how to assist the, those vulnerable people. That is very, very important. Yes, we, we, are, we, we are taking our steps to save our people, no doubt about it. But we are not the amateurs, but we are going to be more affected. So it gotcha. is uh, not only ours, it is, uh, I, I think now it become the global responsibility. Well, let me, I'm gonna ask uh, Vice President Gore, um, Al, you got a, a new version of an inconvenient truth coming out that we're all excited to see. And I know it, it deals with um, some of the most exciting solution sets coming down yeah. the, the pipe. If the Prime Minister invited you to give some advice, because you know the technologies that are coming that can help her with her dilemma, of 180 million people, there's cheap coal right there, got to feed the country. She didn't cause the climate change, the world's telling her to change. What are some of the things coming down the pipe that might help a country like Bangladesh um, escape this wrenching dilemma? 
Well, as you said earlier, it is, it is a, a great opportunity as well as a challenge. And the Prime Minister hasn't asked me for advice, but you've asked me to give it to her. <laughs> Up until last year, Bangladesh was the fastest deploying nation in all the world for, for solar panels. Wow. Muhammad, two per minute, two systems per minute, night and day, 24 hours a day on average. That has now uh, uh, slowed down. There is a plan to build a new dirty coal plant in the Sunderbans, the largest mangrove forest in the world, the last remaining tiger preserve. Thousands of people are demonstrating against it. My advice would be don't build that dirty coal plant, but double down on a more rapid shift toward renewable energy because the private sector in Bangladesh assisted by low, low, low small uh, credit from Mohammed Yunus's organization and others, has really set the world record in rapidly installing renewable electricity. Well, you see, uh, well, I don't understand why people raise this issue, because the, well, the coal-based power plant, it is everywhere in the world. Now, what we are doing, where we are establishing it, it is far, far away from Sundarban. And not only that, we have taken all the steps so that environment sh should not be affected. And it is a super critical power plant, very modern, and we have taken all measurement to save our <coughs> environment. And not only that, we have coal-based power plant, which is not very modern one. It is inside our land, the place called uh, Dinaspur, one of our you know, district, where all the human beings are living. And we see no bad effect in the environment. The crops we are growing, there are plenty of trees, the, the fruit bear, fruits bearing trees, even the very good mango we produce there. So if you go there, you can see that in, in the land, there is coal-based power plant, thermal power plant. We started it perhaps in two, since 2000. Now the, there is a first phase, second phase, the third phase we are building. We don't see any bad effect in our environment there. Well, you're the only... But you, now you're... in the Sundarbor is that area, mm. you know, we are very much concerned about it. And the, the tiger, Royal Bengal tiger, mm. it is not going to be affected at all. But the people, those who are raising the issue, well, I invited them, why don't you go yourself and see? Mm. It is 14 kilometers far away from Sundarbon, mm. and the place which is declared as the world heritage, it is 65 to 70 kilometer far, far away. Mm. It is just in the bank of a river, and mm. on the base of that power plant, now, the, <laughs> well, that part is developing. Uh, the local people are very happy. Mm. Now, the, my point is, in 2000, when we established power plant in the land, just, uh, in, uh, well, one of our district, densely populated district, nobody raised the issue. It means, it's, uh, sometimes it seems to me that they don't uh, think about the people or human being. But now, they are worried about our <coughs> Royal Bengal Tiger or Sundarbon. But well, I am telling you one thing. Mm. We have taken many steps. Already we have started uh, building the green belt in the, our coastal area. We increased our forest. Uh, when I became prime minister in first time in 1996, our forest was only 7%. Now, we develop it about 17%, but our target is increased up to 25%, uh, I mean, green belt and the, you know, uh, I mean, 
area. So, Just so we don't, we don't, we don't. So wanna... it it is not at all issue. Yeah. But the people, those who are raising the issue, I don't understand. They have no point to. Well, they are shouting. They are do, uh, demonstrating. It is true, mm. but what is the real reason or what is the real effect? They cannot spell out. Uh, that is the crucial if thing. If I could just add but very, it is very, really, very, the... very, no, it is very, very unfortunate because we have to provide, uh, you know, energy to our people. Because I have to develop our country. Understand. If you cannot develop the economic condition of your people, then how you will save our people? We have to ensure the food security. We have to give them job opportunity. We have to develop economically, socially, the social safety net program. Already we reduce our poverty level to 22%, yeah. which is 51%. But this power plant is necessary for our development. And I'm telling you, it is the most modern power plant we are going to establish. Prime Minister, I think you framed the challenge really well. Uh, Ella, I want to give you uh, just a chance to make an intervention, then also talk a little bit about the new version of Inconvenient Truth, and then we want to bring everybody else in, because I think yeah, you'll be excited to know what's coming, but go ahead. Just one more point on this. The World Heritage Center has petitioned uh, Bangladesh to protect this site and not build this another dirty coal plant. Uh, you mentioned the river. Several coal ships have already sunk in the river. The pumping of 5,000 cubic meters of water out of the coal plant into that uh, endangered area is also an issue. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, partly because of the tigers, but also the other species, have also petitioned to protect that. Uh, and no one's uh, proposing to curb the right to development. But I would hope the news media would look, uh, if they have time, uh, at all of the issues involved with this. Now, the, thank you for asking about the movie. Uh, it will premiere at the Sundance Film Festival uh, tomorrow night. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave here in Davos about 2 a.m. this morning. But thank you very much. It's an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power. And uh, I, I uh, hope that it uh, is well received. And thank you very much for giving me a chance to mention it. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I invite uh, Vice President to come to Bangladesh, uh, and I will take you to that place. Mm. You can see it in your own eyes, mm. and the coal will be carried in a covered cargo. Thank you. Not an open one. Thank you for that. And it, it will I never, it will <laughs> never <laughs> damage our... Look, this is my country. And since I become Prime Minister, this country is developing. This country is developing. We reduce our poverty level. We, uh, our economic condition is increasing. We achieve 7.1% GDP. So the people, those who are crying about this uh, environment and all these things, perhaps they have something different in their mind. But I they, cannot, should, prove, they yeah. cannot prove that, yes, it will damage our uh, Shundarbon or our tiger or no, they cannot prove, I can challenge. I think we, we, we framed you. the debate really well. Thank so you. Thank you both. I yeah. think Vice President will come and see. I hope so. And I, I want to come too. Um, uh, <laughs> Prime Minister Solberg, um, you know, Norway has been such a leader on the deforestation and climate issue. Um, but we've got a new political context now, new political context in Europe. Um, uh, and a wholly new political context in America. Um, uh, the United States may flip uh, at the end of this week from being a climate leader, a climate mitigation leader, to the leading climate denier. Mm -hmm. How will this affect a country like Norway and your mission and agenda? Well, for Norway, um, I'd usually say, yes, we are trying to find new ways of dealing with the emissions, both in Norway and outside. 
we have to be honest, Norway is a gas, oil and gas producing country. Our wealth is built on fossil fuels. And, and even if Norway doesn't use most for, uh, we have, uh, s I think, nearly 70% renewables in our, our um, uh, energy consumption. And uh, it's basically our transportation system that really has large emissions and some businesses that we are trying to work on CCS projects and others. We still. Uh, of course, as an oil and gas producing country, know that we are part of the problem for other countries. That's why we also feel a moral obli uh, obligation to, to continue. I don't see that the changes in Europe is going to change the climate agenda. Mm -hmm. I believe that the Brits are going to continue being active on this. I uh, believe my sister party, the Conservatives in Britain, is going to hold firm to uh, an agenda against emissions and try to work on that. Uh, I think um, uh, the challenge, of course, would be that some of the European constructions around the ETS systems and other things will change. Uh, but I think the basic structures of that, which is the framework Norway also follows up on, is going to be there for our, our national cuts. The challenge with the, with the United States is, of course, uh, the, the Paris Agreement is put in place. Uh, is. It is in place. Yes. It, it comp it, it, it's a long process to get out of it again. But of course, um, not implementing it might be a possibility for a new administration. I still believe that there is a big momentum, and I meet leaders from cities and, 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 and states in the US that are firm on the belief that they should participate in the work to combat climate change. So I hope there will be a mobilization. And I think if we really are, if the rest of us are putting focus on the transformation of new types of energy, getting better business uh, deals on this, making sure that the investments goes further, I always believe that those who are investing in what's healthy and for the nature and for people will win in the long term. So people who will continue to deny will fall back, lose opportunities in the future. And if the European Union continues to put its stamp on, 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 and on demands on different products, uh, make sure that we, we are using our sort of combined purchasing powers in, 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 um, in lifting new products that do put demands on what type of production process they have been through, then of course it will be a sort of a norm for the whole world. And then, I mean, it might not be as a big problem as it might be if if the Americans starts to fall back. They have not been in the forefront in the history either. They have signed up, but they have not been really in the forefront, have they? It is frightening, uh, I can speak as an American, to think that there are neo-Nazi parties in Europe that believe in climate change, and our second major party doesn't, um, now to soon be the ruling party, but I, I'm not supposed to be on the panel. So, um, uh, Patrick, um, you know, how does a, a big food company uh, in China use its supply chain to help us scale the Paris Agreement and help China participate in that scaling? The scale of uh, climate change? How do you use your supply chain uh, to help us scale these whole, all these mitigation efforts um, uh, on behalf of China, on behalf of your own company, which I know is yeah. something you're thinking a lot about? Yeah. Uh, Thomas, uh, Kofco, we are running a global supply chain. So basically, the supply chain extends from alternation with the farmer in the field to bring the food to the ta dinner table. Yeah. So basically, we are getting our feedbacks on a daily basis, on a global basis. So I think from, from a commercial uh, uh, point of view, that it is the, the government and the global entities that set the target, but where are the commercials? We are in, in, a, in a position to really work out the tools and techniques to get the result. Yeah. So I think it's, it's important that, you know, that what we can contribute as a commercial company and a commercial, the whole sectors, and we can do to the climate change. So I think it's important that you need to have a, you need to have a commitment. You need to have a standard. So I think we are lucky that you know, we have investors like IFC, the Tamasic, you know, and uh, and uh, Kofco, we are following, you know, the the kind of you know, international standard, you know, set up by those global institute, 
It is a commitment to sustainability that we pledge to have. So those global standards yeah. are really important for a company like yours. Exactly. Yours. So, so I would say that, you know, with globalization, so you get to know all the global standard. The good things that, you know, the large company, large institutions can bring to you. And it's important that, you know, you have to turn your, your pledge into concrete measures. Hmm. So basically, you know, we, we basically, uh, we, we record, you know, all, all the footprints, carbon footprints, and, and also we get you know, third party verifications. So it's important that you share the, your internal, your, your data with the external experts in these uh, in this, uh, in this matters, and to get certifications of your progress. And it's important that you have to turn your, your, uh, your, you know, your commitment into actions. So Kofco, uh, we are the largest, bio, we are one of the major biofuel players in, in, in South America, mm -hmm. and uh, especially with the biofuel, biodiesel bio and bioethanol. And we are the largest biofuel player in China. So we're supplying you know, to uh, nine of China's you know, provinces. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as for sourcing, that I think it's important that we source agricultural products from environmentally sensitive in area responsibly. Yeah, so uh, make sure you know, there's no land conversion, uh, land change conversions, and uh, make sure there's no deforestations within our supply chain. You know, take soybean sourcing, you know, for example, in South America, in, in Brazil. Like, so we basically, we screen, you know, all, we screen, you know, all the pre-financed suppliers. You know, in uh, in Amazon and and Cerrado Biomass. Yeah. So we even use satellite imagery to map the land, make sure it's not deforested land. Mm. Yeah. So this is, and also we seek to uh, we seek to uh, uh, we seek to uh, you know reuse uh, and uh, and recycle uh, uh, a model. So take uh, uh, hog farming for example. So basically we use the biogas for energy, and we use the you know we use the buyers by slurry, you know, to turn, to turn the manure into by slurry and, and to, to use it as a fertilizer, organic fertilizer. And we even, you know, reroute uh, root all the by slurry, you know, back to the alfalfa field mm. to make, uh, you know, to make, uh, you know, the high nutrition feed, you know, for, 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 the, for the dairy cattle, mm. yeah. So, and it's, it's important that we have to collaborate. So, uh, although, you know, we are commercially uh, conceived as a, as a competitor, you know, with our uh, global peers, you know, A, B, C, Ds. Uh, so, but we speak with each other on the climate issues mm -hmm. and exchange views how to achieve sustainable growth. And, uh, and we held discussions with, uh, with our Paulson Institute uh, and, and, uh, uh, and talk about, you know, Sino-U.S. relations, Sino-U.S. You know, situations, sustainable development of agricultural, uh, ecological protection and the climate. And also, we talk about we hold discussions with uh, with the uh, uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Growth, on the, about you know, this is, you know climate kind of uh, uh, you know mm -hmm. climate smart agriculture and, and sustainable growth. And it's, it's it's important that you know we have to get result. Yeah. So in order to encourage commercials to really to really to encourage to make a further investment in doing that, in the last five years, our our uh, energy consumption. Is, uh, is, uh, is reduced by uh, more than 16%. You know, one of the points yeah, that uh, yeah. um, President -elect Trump makes is that when he's asked about Paris, he says, well, you know, I'll look at this, but um, we don't want it to hurt our company's yeah. competitiveness. But what you're saying yeah. is, uh, I assume you're doing fine living within these standards and even thriving more, it sounds like. Since, since, since all this, you know, waste, that, that's just wasted energy as well. Yeah, Tom, uh, I think there's one thing. One thing uh, I, it's actually, it's really impressed me back to, uh, I would say, you know, five years ago, when I first take uh, like uh, agri-seminar in Harvard University, mm -hmm. and they have agri-seminar every January. So it's impressed me that, you know, the, the overall dynamic at that time, I would say, you know, more than five years ago in China, is so much different compared with, you know, the <coughs> dynamic in Europe. Yeah, Prime Minister just mentioned that. In Europe, you have high standard of, of consumption. So consumer consumption is really the driver, and NGOs is really the driver to really to reshape the whole supply chain, reshape the whole industry. So, so I think today what happens in Europe is what is exactly happening today in China. 
you know. So, so consumers, when they, when they get to the supermarket, they will look at, you know, what is the company? Hmm. How is the supply chain? How is the carbon footprint? Hmm. You know, where is the traceability? So all those questions, you know, you, you probably, you are forced to do that. Yeah. So I would say that it's a, it's a, instead of a cost, but it's a more competitive advantage. Because? For, yeah, because the consumer, you know, would, would, you know, would like to, uh, uh, to buy, you know, commodities with, with uh, you know, uh, in coming from companies to really responsible and uh, to be responsible in a, in a kind of, uh, you know, really uh, uh, environmentally friendly and responsible for mm -hmm. the, you know, cli to change, the climate change. Yeah. Yeah. Could um, I make a, could I make a quick suggestion, Tom? Please. Kafka is establishing a fantastic reputation. Sustain, if you sustain people, you have to sustain the planet. Wonderful slogan and in keeping with what your president uh, has, has done and said here. Norway has the world leading reputation in helping to protect the Earth's forest. Congratulations on that. One of the problems you face in trying to live up to your ideals, Patrick, is it's very difficult if you are trying to buy palm oil, for example, uh, to find the sustainable forms. Uh, people like Paul Pullman and some others have done great work there. But there has been a lot of discussion in the NGO community, Prime Minister, about the possibility of Norway uh, adding a, a slightly different approach and using your generosity and your commitment and idealism. You mean your taxpayers' money, sir? To, and your taxpayers' money. I, <laughs> God bless you. Uh, to, to help Kafka identify accurately what the truly uh, sustainable areas of that forest are in Indonesia, where the peat forests are just, uh, you know, the, the carbon outgassing and the environmental damage is horrible. So maybe here at the World Economic Forum, a little partnership could emerge between Nor Norway and Kafka. Uh, one can hope. Well, you know, that's a, it's a great idea. And while Al and I are beating up on everyone on the panel, we want to bring Stuart in. <laughs> you, can, and, um, you can get Stuart in on right. palm oil, so, uh, because, uh, so we can bring Stuart uh, in on palm you, oil. You, you have a similar dilemma, Stuart, really, that uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, of Bangladesh. On the one hand, you guys have been really important funders yeah. of uh, climate mitigation and adaptation technologies. And yet this week, Greenpeace came out with a report yep. uh, condemning uh, HSBC for funding palm oil um, exploitation. How do you wrestle with both sides of that coin? So, I mean, it's a really good question, and it's the, exactly the dilemma that the Vice President and Prime Minister were debating, because um, I saw the Minister of Trade and Investment from Malaysia earlier this week. Palm oil employs a million people in Malaysia. Uh, it employs nearly four million people in Indonesia. And obviously, there's a demand for palm oil. You know, Nestle, Unilever demand it. We all use palm oil in products we touch every day. Actually, the food industry, it replaced trans fats, which were actually killing large numbers of people. So, so the issue is, how can we be, so the issue actually is, spits into the sort of this dilemma. We can step away from funding palm oil, but actually then our influence disappears. Mm -hmm. So actually, we are a member of the round table on sustainable palm oil ourselves. And actually what we require our clients to do, and what Greenpeace have said is, you've got bigger exposure than everyone else, you've got a policy but you don't enforce it. We would factually disagree with the last point. But we actually use our influence to force change. And for example, we've closed something like 104 relationships with palm oil companies since 2014 because they wouldn't agree to hit RSPO standards by 2018. Mm -hmm. so, so the reason, and it's reputationally very dangerous to stay engaged in these sectors for, for the obvious reasons of the Greenpeace report. <clears throat> but we actually see ourselves as potentially a force for good because the fact of the matter is, if we stepped away from these two massive agricultural sectors, or these two the single agricultural sectors in two countries, it's not that they won't get finance. Okay, so the fact of the matter is, they'll find alternative finance from institutions that may not have the same sense of responsibility that we do. Mm -hmm. So I actually met with um, the head of Greenpeace a bit earlier today mm. to talk about an active engagement between ourselves and Greenpeace. So if we're going in the spirit of Davos, we should join this Norwegian mm. Kofco, and Kofco <laughs> oh, for disclosure as a client of ours, um, in terms of, of, of this initiative. Because I think by staying involved, you hopefully can can reconcile the dilemma, because there is a human development employment need in these countries, and at the same time, there's a broader need to, you know, the, the natural environment that we all live in that clearly is damaged by, by 
non-sustainable palm oil plantations. Yes. Uh, Prime Minister, you wanted to make an interjection. Yes. Well, I've been to um, the rainforest at Sumatra. I've met the palm oil, oil producers, and I know that there is millions of people who will lose their jobs if we'd stop buying palm oil. So maybe they can do something else. Maybe, but we don't know. But what we know is that they can produce it without harming, without cutting down more forests. They can do it more efficient. They can use their land more efficient. And that's why this initiative, as I said, this new type of, of having innovative ways of increasing agricultural production uh, and uh, trying to find partnership now, both in the private sector, and I hear you said yes, and I see maybe you can do it into your, your, your supply chains to get the farmers to produce more effect effective because they get bonuses and knowledges through a program that we would like to put up, and we would like to put money, and we are trying to get partners from other countries into this in the areas around the rainforest so that they can produce agriculture, meet the demands, create the jobs, be certificated into to a chain of production line that means that consumers can feel that they are buying products that are real. But we know that you can three, four times agricultural production in these areas if they are doing more modern methods, if they're doing more innovative things, they don't need to burn new land to do it. But you know, you, they need the knowledge, and they need, and to have that, they also need investments. And if we are all drawing out the, the money, it's the wrong agenda. We have to work together with them in a different way, and that's what we are trying to build a new initiative on. El, since you spawned the, um, already the Gore initiative, applied, I think. since yes. you spawned yeah. the Gore initiative between Norway, Kafka, <laughs> yes. and HSBC, <laughs> I want to give you one minute quick intervention to comment on any of this. Did you have any reaction to, on to all that? On yeah, on, on all of this whole the, this whole question. Of yeah, well, the main pr how the main you balance this question the... of financing yeah. jobs and yet um, uh, n n not making things worse? Yeah, I mean, I think the finance, I think the jobs uh, can go to projects that are managed sustainably. Uh, and if there is a good monitoring program, and if there are uh, uh, purchasers that really are desperate to try to live up to their ideals, then it can work. We now have, uh, you know, the satellite WRI's Forest Watch and Will Marshall's Planet Labs will soon have a, a complete image of every tree every 24 hours. I mean, we have the ability to do this. At the bottom of it is, is corruption uh, on the ground uh, in the areas of Indonesia involved here. And everybody knows it, yeah. that. And it's, it's just very difficult. And internet-based, uh, crowdsourced, uh, corru anti-corruption efforts are really important in many areas of uh, this effort to solve the climate crisis because corruption is one of the biggest sources uh, of the climate crisis. Yeah. I want to ask uh, Patricia, uh, Patricia Espinoza, uh, the UNFCC head. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're coming to the conclusion here, Patricia. Why, why don't you give us the last word? Uh, well, certainly not the last word <laughs> after all what we have heard. And I would like to start by thanking uh, you and uh, all the panelists for your leadership and your efforts in uh, addressing the climate agenda. Um, I, I did want, actually, I, I did want to address another issue, which it has to Please. do with the financing of natural solutions, nature-based solutions, land use, and uh, other nature-based solutions. It has been partly addressed, but I do believe that uh, it would be very beneficial if we could develop a very specific set of uh, instruments for financing of these solutions. So what would you um, be so kind of uh, offering to us? Who would like to take up the chairman's well, I, question? I, I, no, go I ahead, would. please. I, I, I would, and the, the prime minister made the point that she needs uh, access to reasonably priced uh, financing. Uh, the, World, the World Bank had made the largest loan in history uh, uh, for renewables to India last year, a billion dollars. It's made a tremendous difference. India is now moving so quickly. But here we are in a world with almost zero interest rates, but these developing and emerging countries that want to finance uh, solar and wind and, and, and smart grids and batteries 
go out and th they have to get interest at 12, 13 percent with a foreign exchange. Uh, I mean, th this is an opportunity, again, for the world to, to put its money where the Paris Agreement is in a way that will save us all. The opportunity here, again, on lifting the economy is fantastic. May I close with a quick, an old political yeah. joke? Please. It's an old political joke. It's about a, a man who was uh, caught as a flood started uh, washing uh, through his community. Uh, and he sat on his porch and uh, an SUV came by to rescue him and he said, no, God will provide. And the truck went on. The water kept rising and he went up to the second floor and he's looking out the window. And the, the boat came by with rescuers. Come on, come on. No, God will provide. He climbed up. The water got up above the uh, edge of the roof. He climbed out the roof. He's sitting there on the roof. And a helicopter comes down, drops a rope ladder. He says, no, God will provide. Well, he dies in the flood. He goes to heaven and he meets God. And he said, God, what happened? Why didn't you provide? And God said, what do you mean? I sent you an SUV, a boat, and a helicopter. <laughs> and this opportunity to solve the climate crisis, jobs intensive, is the helicopter to save the global economy. We need to take it. A wonderful punctuation on the whole thing. Thank you very much. Thank this panel. It's been a, a terrific discussion. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.